Okay, welcome to the Unit 3 videos. This is the first of two lesson videos. And in this video, we're going to get a history lesson. We're going to get a little bit of history of programming languages. And there are tons of programming languages. Dozens, scores, hundreds of programming languages. I know, I don't know, maybe 20, 25 of them. Um, but there are hundreds that I've never even used or possibly not even seen. Uh, people who study programming languages usually group them into generations that share uh, certain uh, common characteristics. So let's take a look at the five generations of programming languages that have happened so far. And of course, with as with most things in this class, some people don't agree that there have been five, some think there have only been four. But we'll talk about it and you'll see what some of the common characteristics are. Here's a real simple characterization of the five generations, or maybe just four. First generation was machine language, more on that later. Second generation, assembly languages, a step up in the abstraction from machine languages. Third generation, procedural languages. Fourth generation, declarative languages. And fifth generation, artificial intelligence. Although that's somewhat of a misnomer because you can do artificial intelligence programming in third generation languages. You know, I've done a lot of that myself. Now there's no real clear definition or delineation of what these generations are. And uh, knowledgeable experts disagree on which generation specific languages fall under. It's just a way to group things to um, make them a little bit easier to talk about. Now, what is this first generation, the machine language one? Well, up until the early 1950s, if you wanted to write code for a computer, you had to understand the hardware, the electronics, the CPU, of that computer. You had to write your code in the language of the machine using zeros and ones. Sometimes you do it by going to uh, to the hardware itself and instead of typing in a program you would reattach the wires. You see the movie imitation game? Uh, that's what they were doing back in the 1940s. It was very, very specific to the computer being used. It required the programmer to know the instruction set of the target computer, the exact configuration of memory, and there weren't any tools to help you. No compilers, assemblers, debuggers, and so on. The program was directly loaded into the computer and executed. Sometimes it might take you like a week to change a program and be able to run it. Now, in the second generation, we have assembly languages. These started coming about in the mid-1950s. They were still very specific to a particular computer, like the assembly language for, um, let's see what, what some of the computers were at that time, for large IBM computers and uh, Univac computers were very different from each other. and. That continued for decades. The assembly language for an Intel uh, x86 computer would be completely different than for a Motorola chip based computer. The big advance was you could use symbols to refer to some locations in memory. So you could write what was like a machine language program, but you could write it in something that a human had some chance of understanding. But you still had to know the computer's instruction set. You didn't do something like, say, the value of uh, variable Fahrenheit equals uh, nine-fifths times the variable of the or the value of the variable Celsius or anything like that. You had to do something like load memory address, and you could give the memory address a name, into register 4. Load memory address, give another one, into register 7. Add register 7 to register 4, putting the results in register 4. Store results of register 4 into memory location for such and such. It was very difficult to write, and programs were very long and complicated to debug. Now here's an example of some assembly language code. This is assembly language code from the um, 
IBM mainframe assembly language. Remember in unit, uh, let's see, unit one, you did something that had you look up the date for the IBM 360, and it came out in 1964. This is programming like you might have done for that machine. So there are statement now I don't expect you to understand this but uh, well I expect you to understand what I'm saying but I don't expect you to understand it well enough to be able to write an assembly language machine here's an instruction the letter L it means load load to comma data that says find the four bytes of data that happen at whatever memory location data is and here we've said this part of memory is data, which is declare a constant with a value of 25. Load that into register 2. Then add whatever is at the memory location that we've called con for constant. Notice that's right here, F10. Add that to whatever is in memory 2, or register 2. Now, this is what the programmer would write. Things like is circled here. This is what the assembler would translate it into. This is really ones and zeros, but instead of writing out ones and zeros binary code, each four binary digits are grouped together into one hexadecimal digit. So 5820B022 is what this one language turned into. If you were writing machine language, you'd have to write this. Writing assembly language, you write this and run it through an assembler. Third generation languages. They started being developed in the mid-1950s. Some of the famous ones from then are still in use, although they're, the use of these languages is getting less and less, like COBOL and FORTRAN were both around in the 1950s. There are new ones being developed even today. There are tons of third generation languages or 3GLs. This is what most professional programmers think of as programming languages. They're procedural. The programmer specifies a sequence of instructions, a procedure, which is then compiled into machine language before being executed. It doesn't have to track one-to-one -one what the uh, the actual instruction set on the computer's CPU are. You could have a statement like x equals y plus 7 and that might turn into three or four different machine language instructions. The program that you use to take what you wrote that's supposedly understandable by a human into something understandable and runnable by the computer is called a compiler. Okay, here's some examples of third generation languages. Fortran, COBOL, PL1, Pascal. Those are all some older ones that were very popular at one time in certain places. Here are some that have come up since then. C, C++, C Sharp, Basic, Java, Ada, and so on. There are lots more. Some of you may have heard of Python. For example, that's a third generation language, even though it's fairly recent compared to some of the others. Source code written in a third generation language can be compiled on different machines. As long as there's a compiler on those machines, you can compile it. Um, you can't just run the machine code from one machine on another, but you can take your source code and compile it on different machines, and the same code, theoretically, can work on different types of computers. The next video is going to give you some details on the types of things that all 3GLs have to be able to do. So for now, let's just move on. Fourth generation languages. These specify what needs to be done, not how to do it. Remember, third generation language was procedural. X equals Y plus 7. For I starting at 14 up to I uh, having a value of 32 while incrementing by ones, do the following statements. Um, those, if value of variable x is less than 17, perform this statement. 
else perform some other statement. Those are examples of third generation languages. In a fourth generation language, you specify this is what needs to be done, not how to do it. Like structured query language or SQL, some of you have probably heard that acronym. The programmer describes the data they want to retrieve or update from their database, but not how to find it. The translator of the fourth generation language figures out, well, if the data in the database is stored this way, then I have to turn this into these statements to get there. Um, Prolog is another fourth generation language. Uh, was used in academia a fair amount, never really used a lot commercially. Uh, the programmer specified a series of logical propositions. So you're doing everything with logic. There are a bunch of visual languages in which the programmer specifies what they want the user interface to look like, and then the compiler for the language turns it into the code that builds that user interface. Some things uh, like Visual Basic or HTML. There's not really a firm dividing line between the third generation languages and the fourth generation languages. There are some languages that have characteristics characteristics of both. And there's not a firm dividing line between fourth generation and fifth generation languages. In fact, fifth generation languages, according to some scholars, are even more abstract than 4GLs. They specify a goal and the program generates its own language to accomplish that goal. Some experts think we don't have any of these fifth generation languages yet. That Others think that some tools that are used in the artificial intelligence field uh, or neural networks meet the criteria. Um, I'm not yet sold on this, that there's anything that I can say is different than a fourth generation language. And like I said before, you can implement artificial intelligence algorithms even using a third generation language. But if you, you, know, if you go Google programming language generations. Some of the sources will tell you there are five generations. Others will say there's only four. Okay, in our next video, we're going to be uh, taking a look at the details of some third generation languages, since that's what most programming is done in, to give you a little bit of idea of what a programmer does.